In this last Evo Devo video, we'll be looking at molecular genetics and more modern approaches to understanding the relationship between development and evolution. So molecular developmental evolution, so this is using modern molecular tools to look directly at genotypic differences and their effect on phenotypes. Specifically how, when, and where genes are expressed is altered, and so we can look at what happens to the phenotype when we alter the expression of these genes. So regulatory sequences control gene expression during development. This you learned in 212 or 340 or 370. Mutations in these sequences can change the function of a protein. And this is an interesting concept because we often think about a protein having a biochemical function, right? So what is the chemical reaction it does? But it also has an evolutionary function, right? What is it doing that contributes to the fitness of the organism? So a protein maybe acquires a different evolutionary function, even if its biochemical function is exactly the same, just by being expressed in a different tissue or at a different time during development. So we used to actually think biochemical function was the most important thing to think about, but we're now actually really beginning to think that it's the evolution of regulation may be a really more potent force for evolution than just the evolution of protein biochemical function, because in fact, many, many organisms their proteins do pretty much the same thing. It's when and where they do them that might make all the difference. So first off, what exactly is a gene anyway that we're thinking about for our, our purposes? If we think about a gene like this, we have transcription factors, which are trans elements, that is, they're kind of floating around, and they're going to bind to these things, which are in the DNA sequence near the gene. These are called cis elements. So cis is on the same chromosome. Trans factors are coming in from somewhere else. Transcription factors are proteins that bind to these binding sites, and by binding, they're going to turn those genes on or off. So for example, binding at all four of these sites is what turns on expression in these two locations in this developing organism. So the sequence of each binding site is critical to the binding of the trans elements, right? They match up. And evolution of the binding sites can lead to changes in gene expression. So for example, slight changes in the sequences here may cause these trans elements to bind better or worse. And for example, if mutation causes this element to be knocked out, then maybe the trans element can't bind. And if it can't bind, it wouldn't cause expression of that protein here, whereas binding here causes expression during development here. So changes in the cis elements can influence when and where genes are expressed during development. And also the trans elements that are secreted throughout the organism are also important. So it's an interplay between the trans elements that are binding and the cis elements that are being bound, both of them together determining when and where these genes are being expressed. So the regulatory genes that are studied the most are Hox genes. These are trans factors or transcription factors. They're trans elements for a whole series of what are called downstream genes, so other genes that are activated by them. The absence or presence of particular Hox genes in tissues during development controls a bunch of other genes. So this is a bithorax mutant. Normally these guys don't have a second pair of wings, but with this mutation, Hox gene not being expressed um, or being expressed differently in this part of the body causes it to activate all the genes to make a pair of wings there as well as there, even though they should only have one. This is an Antenopedia mutant, so when the gene that is the trans factor that's normally expressed in the region that develops legs, when that's expressed in the head, you actually see legs grow out of the head of this thing where the antenna would be. And again, that's all these genes that make legs are present in all the cells of the body. They're just activated by these trans elements, a mutation in the location of where those trans elements are expressed can have these big effects. We can do experiments where, for example, manipulation in which gene product is added to an organism, so we can add genetic factors in something that's called ectopic expression, where we kind of manually add our own genes, they can reveal these effects as well. So we can do things like create eyes on legs, and in other places not only producing eyes, so we can create extra eyes by adding the gene that is a trans factor that tells cells to develop into eyes. We can create extra eyes, even on legs, and a really interesting example, in Drosophila, you can take the Drosophila EY gene, express it, and get it Drosophila to grow eyes elsewhere on their body. Right, that trans factor is activating all the other downstream genes. 
but you can in fact also take the gene that normally is expressed in the heads of mice that causes them to develop camera lens eyes. If you take that mouse gene and put it into Drosophila, you'll actually see it activates the downstream genes not to make some sort of mouse eye, but it actually makes Drosophila eyes. So that tells us that the function of these genes is not actually anything to do with the type of eye that is developed, but rather it is a gene that activates all the other genes that make eyes. And so that's a really interesting type of gene, right? It doesn't make particular parts of eyes, it just turns on all the other genes that make whatever eyes those genes are designed to do. The patterning of these genes are correlated with the presence or absence of certain structures. Here's looking at brine shrimp and insects, right, two arthropods. If you look at antennapedia, it's expressed throughout most of the body in brine shrimp, and you actually see development of legs. Antennapedia is expressed in a more narrow range in insects, and you only see legs develop where antennapedia is expressed, right? So you could imagine that evolving from something with lots of legs to something with fewer legs could be done just by reducing the region in which antennapedia is expressed. And so changing where these genes are expressed in these different organisms can give you different final body structures. And we see Hox genes in Drosophila, which was what we've been looking at. Hox genes are expressed in different parts of the body and they tell a bunch of other genes to activate to guide the development of those portions of the body. Invertebrates and vertebrates are related, so we actually see we have a hypothetical common ancestor, and we can see the same sorts of Hox genes in vertebrates. So like mouse, for example, has the exact same system where Hox genes are expressed in a gradient along the body, and they activate the development of those regions. The same Hox genes kind of line up. We do actually have four copies instead of just one copy in mammals, for example, but they seem to be doing the same thing, right? They're not actually coding for the structures of a head. They are coding for the activation of all the other genes that make a head or make a head. And a number of different gene duplications have occurred, right? I mentioned that mice actually have four copies of all these Hox genes, whereas other organisms are more distant relatives, only have one copy. So gene duplications increase the number of genes per Hox complex during the evolution and the origin of bilateria and also increase the number of Hox clusters. So we have more copies of each of these and we have more copies along like this during vertebrate radiation, right? So mammals appear to have more copies than amphioxus or amphibians, that sort of thing. And so one interesting question from an evolutionary point of view is, does the presence of more genes allow more complexity in structures, right? So maybe these organisms can be more complex than these organisms because they have more genes that would allow that to occur during development. So models of gene duplication may explain this Hox gene evolution. This kind of increased complexity would arise if we saw evidence of multiple functions where maybe they have multiple functions here and they can be separated out into different copies here. If we see pleiotropy, and we do in fact see pleiotropy in lots of developmental genes, the cervical vertebrae and cancer example that we saw earlier. So we know that there are multiple functions here that could perhaps be separated out. And do we see evidence of multiple genes for one function? So maybe these copies here, having arisen initially from one copy, maybe now both of them will have a similar function. So that's multiple genes having the same function. And we see some evidence in Hox A11 and Hox D11. So this is the Hox A11 and D11 that we'll be looking at. When I'm talking about gene duplication, let's think about, there's a traditional model of evolution by gene duplication. This is thinking about where do new genes come from. You have some sort of locus that has some sort of allele doing some sort of function. There's a gene duplication event, right? This is just a mutation in an individual, and maybe it then fixes by drift, and there's a substitution, and now everybody has two copies. Now there's two possible things that can occur. A mutation could occur that creates an advantageous allele, and now you've got a new locus with a different function. Or you could have a deleterious allele that kind of knocks out that second locus and that creates a pseudogene, kind of like those globins that we looked at in the very beginning of the course. All those pseudogenes are deactivated copies from this sort of state here. So where do new genes come from? Gene duplication via this process can lead to different loci, so maybe like these Hox genes or something like that. And it can also lead to pseudogenes. 
we might expect this to occur a lot more because beneficial mutations are rare compared to deleterious ones. So if we think about this pathway to create new loci, we would expect this to happen a lot more than this, and maybe this to be kind of unlikely. But this is totally the sort of idea that almost everybody has had for all, throughout the 20th century about where new genes come from. There's an alternative model, and this is actually motivated by EvoDevo considerations, called this duplication degeneration complementation model. You start off with a pleiotropic allele, or pleiotropic locus, right, multiple functions, coding from this same locus, and then a couple of promoter sites here, a couple of sites here that influence when and where the gene is expressed. Gene duplication event gives us two copies of this gene, and now a deleterious allele at this site could knock out this and cause this gene that used to be expressed in both red and blue tissues to now be only expressed in blue tissues. This gene is still the same as it was before, but now this gene, a deleterious mutation here, might restrict its expression to this type of tissues. So now you have two different genes. They're expressed in different tissues. That means they have different functions. They're descended from a multifunctional ancestor locus and this process is driven by deleterious mutations, right? The diversification that we ended up with here was not because of new advantageous alleles arising, but because of deleterious mutations knocking out those promoters. And this process of getting multiple loci from a starter loci is easiest to envision with these mutations in the regulatory sequences. So do we see anything like this? Here's an example from zebrafish. So zebrafish engrailed 1 and engrailed 1b. If we look at the expression pattern during development, engrailed 1 is expressed here in the pectoral appendages, but not so much kind of in the brain region. Engrailed 1b is not expressed in the pectoral appendages of developing zebrafish, but is expressed in the brain. And when we look at their closest relatives, we see that engrailed is expressed in both the pectoral appendages and in the brain. So we see some kind of examples of this duplication, degeneration, and complementation model. And we can understand the evolution of these genes by thinking about development. And we can understand a bit about the development of these guys by thinking about the evolution of these genes. Returning to Hox genes, Hox genes 9 through 13 are also involved in the development of vertebrate limbs. So in addition to kind of the anterior, posterior axis of the entire body, they're also involved in development of the limbs. So these genes, therefore, have pleiotropy, multiple functions. And when we look at the limb, we see that 9 makes the scapula, 10 gives the humerus, 11 is like the radius ulna, 12 is the carpals, and then 13 is the phalanges. So where these Hox genes are expressed lines up with getting these different sorts of final structures. But there's also some redundancy now, because remember we have more than one copy of each of these Hox genes. So Hox A11 and Hox D11, we can make wild types and knockouts of these and do experiments. This is experiments with mice. The wild type, right, scapula, humerus, radius, ulna, wrist, and digits. If we knock out Hox A11, right, knock out A11, we actually get a normally developing organism. If we have a functional A11 but knock out Hox D11, we have the same thing, right, the whole limb develops, no problem. But if we make a double knockout right, of A11 and D11, then you can actually see that the radius ulna basically disappears, right? It doesn't develop. So Hox A11 or Hox D11 is required for the radius ulna. You don't need both, right? Because you get good development with one or the other. But you need at least one from these two copies. So we have this redundancy of the duplicated genes. They're they're redundant, they copy for each other. And this is a form of epistasis, right, where multiple genes are influencing a certain trait. And the effect of a mutation that would knock out A11 or D11 depends on whether the other gene has a functional form or not. So Hox genes A11 and D11 um, don't code for proteins to make bones. They code for trans elements that turn a bunch of bone development genes on and off. And so Hox A11 and D11, they're not coding for you know, calcium or bone or anything. They're just turning a bunch of other things on and off. And this can get very complicated. So details of how many developmental genes work together 
is the study of developmental regulatory networks, and that can get really complicated past these simple examples that we've been looking at. So for example, here's a simple diagram of gene 1, activates gene 2. When gene 2 activates, it activates gene 5, but represses gene 3, which would have activated gene 4. So what's the effect of gene 1? If it turns on, it turns 2 and 5 on, but it turns 3 and 4 off. Right? So whether or not gene 1 is expressed in a tissue influences whether gene 2 and 5, 3 and 4 are expressed in that tissue. And you can get lots more complicated than that. For example, you can actually make wiring diagrams like this. So this is a study that was published in Science looking at development in the sea urchin, right? looking at echinoderms, comparing it insects, worms, and chordates. And we have a genetic sequence along here. This is just one gene, endo-16. Has a whole bunch of promoter elements, and these elements control the expression of other genes in a series of activations and repressions. Uh, like on that previous slide that I showed with only five genes, it gets much, much more complicated. So the actual process of development is incredibly complex, but with that complexity comes a whole lot of pleiotropy, a whole lot of epistasis, a whole lot of potential for single mutations to maybe have large-scale cascading effects that may highly change the final form of the adult. So how do organisms change their adult form via evolution is highly influenced by what type of developmental regulation they have and what sorts of mutations can occur to lead to changes in the adult form. It's highly influenced by this development. And then what accounts for these diagrams and these different forms of development, it's the evolutionary history. So developments and evolution go back and forth, and understanding one can help with understanding the other. So to return to genes, we can now think about mutational targets of genes, the type of variation that's possible. We have protein structures, so mutations in exons change the amino acid sequence, change the biochemical function. And mutations in regulatory regions can change the expression, timing, and location and that can end up changing the physiological or developmental function. So if we think about a gene having regulatory sequences and translated sequences, both are evolutionary functions. One's a regulatory function, one's kind of a protein function. And so having this approach, having a broader definition of what a gene is and what sorts of mutations are possible and what effects they may have on the final organism can get quite complex but also provides us with a much more sophisticated understanding into the relationship between development and evolution than we had from diagrams like Heckel's in the 1800s.